So I was reading Rules for Radicals last night, and I came across a passage that is just so perfect in the context of the article that we are about to look at today. Let's let's read the rule book that the SJWs that are supporting critical race theory are playing from. Conscience is the virtue of observers and not of agents of action. In action, one does not always enjoy the luxury of a decision that is consistent both with one individual's conscience and the good of mankind. The choice must always B for the latter. Action is for mass salvation and not for the individual's personal salvation. He who sacrifices the mass good for his personal conscience has a peculiar conception of personal salvation. He does not care enough for people to be corrupted for them. He does not care enough about people to be corrupted for them. What this passage essentially says is the ends justify the means. And if you really care about people, if you really care about marginalized, oppressed, this book calls them the have-nots, if you really care about people, then you aren't going to bother yourself with ethics or doing the right thing. None of those things matter because the ends justify the means. And you can throw ethics and conscience And right, right out the window, because none of that matters. None of that matters. If you refuse to do the corrupt thing in support of achieving our desired ends, then you are no better than those evil right-wing Nazis on the far right. That's what that book is saying. And this is what we are seeing played out every single time critical race theory is put on the table. The ends justify the means. And people really need to start wrapping their head around this. This is why, listen, I don't mind intellectuals. Not not as a as a, you know, a general rule. Let them intellectualize, let them let them philosophize about how we got to this point and oh, the basis of critical race theory and, and what it all means and where it's all going to go and have conversation after conversation after conversation where they don't actually do anything, they don't actually fight back. At least not in the same way that these people are fighting back. I have no problem with the intellectuals in general. What I have a problem with is the intellectuals pretending that their methods that are not playing by the same rules are going to put a dent in what this thing is because their opponents are playing by fundamentally different rules and it's just something that they don't seem to want to grasp. And it's with this context that I want to take a look at this article from Reason.com. A professor pushed back against white fragility training. The college investigated her for nine months. This is a really long article. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to give you some flavor for what happened to one tenured professor at a public institution that dared to push back on critical race theory as a way to illustrate what kinds of tactics these people will descend into without giving it a second thought. Let's begin. Elsa Parrott, a newly tenured 38-year-old professor of English at Lake Washington Institute of Technology, the only public technical institute in the state of Washington, realized last June that she had some qualms about the approach her university, which is located in suburban Seattle and has about 6,000 students, had taken to diversity and inclusion. Her concerns about the campus client climate had been mounting for a while. I wasn't exactly open about my political positions at work, but I didn't exactly keep them a secret either, says Parrott, whose heterodox politics led her to vote for Green Party nominee Jill Stein in 2016 and Donald Trump last year. I simply avoided bringing politics up and avoided mentioning my views unless they seemed relevant to things other people had already said. But what cons- most concerned her was an upcoming diversity training in which white faculty and staff would be divided into white and non-white caucuses. This is not how this type of training plays out everywhere, but it is actually playing out this way. I mean, quite a bit actually in this area. Seattle, the the city of Seattle is doing training like this. Obviously, this training is existing in other parts of the state where they are literally bringing back segregation for the purpose of diversity and inclusion. 
The stated goal of such events is to allow people to talk about race and racism more openly, but the decision to have the races meet separately made Parrot uncomfortable. Racial segregation of that kind seems like a throwback to the pre-1960s and not a good way to create any kind of cooperation and collaboration, she said, and she's correct. She wasn't the only one disturbed by this idea of racially segregated anti-racism training. Her friend Phil Snyder, another English professor at LW Tech, said in an email to senior administrators that a conference based on segregation by skin color does nothing to build a community of belonging. Nonetheless, less a June 18th all campus email noted the school's president, the school's president rather, Amy Morrison, had made clear the expectation that all full-time employees attend Friday's courageous conversations unless they had conflicting teaching responsibility. Parrot decided to express her qualms about the training during the training itself. What happened over the next nine months was both bizarre and oppressive because of a brief disruption that easily could have been brushed aside or handled with a warning not to do it again, LW Tech went to war against a tenured faculty member, launching a cartoonishly over-the-top disciplinary process that including the hiring of a private investigator, dozens of interviews, and widespread claims of trauma. And this is the type of backlash that causes people not to speak up when it comes to critical race theory. And listen, I know why you guys are scared. I really do. But as we're reading this article, I also want you to consider the flip side of this. What had happened, what would have happened if she wasn't the only one speaking up? She and her one friend. What would have happened if every single person that really disagreed with this training, because we, we statistically know that's probably at least 50% of people, if not more, what would have happened if every single person that disagreed with this spoke up and had her back? The college would not have been able to get away with this. So while I know you're all scared, I know you see things like this and say, well, why would I even bother? I have to hide what I believe. This is going to come for you eventually. And if you don't speak up when other people are in trouble, if you don't start playing by their rules and calling them out for their racism and what they are doing to the livelihoods of other people, then don't expect anyone to speak up for you when they come for you. And they're going to come for all of you. It's going to happen. Absolutely. Parrot is far from a perfect victim. While she was under investigation, she became convinced that the election had been stolen from Donald Trump, and she and her husband eventually attended that infamous Stop the Steal rally on January 6th. This is where I take issue with this article just a little bit. Some people will likely discount her story because of her participation in an understandably reviled political demonstration. She went to a rally. She went to a rally. She didn't do anything wrong. She didn't, she didn't engage in violence that we know of. There's no evidence that she's engaged in violence. She's allowed to do this. She is allowed to do this under the First Amendment of the Constitution. She works at a public institution where she has tenure. She's allowed to go to a rally to express her political beliefs. I'm sorry. Once Parrot decided she wanted to speak up at her, and by the way, this is one of the things that, that gets in the way of fighting critical race theory, because every single time one of these intellectuals, and yeah, I'm going to look at the person who wrote that and made the choice to include that paragraph. One, every single time one of these intellectuals says, oh, we can't, we can't possibly align with those MAGA supporters, those Trump supporters, then you don't really want to beat this. I'm sorry. Then you are letting them win. Because, because you figured out that they lied to you when it comes to this topic, but you haven't figured out yet that they lied to you about Trump too. I digress. Parrot should have had every reason to believe she could ask questions and express points of disagreement without fear of uh, professional retribution. For one thing, as an employee of a public college, she had robust First Amendment protections that do not generally apply in private workplaces. For another, she had recently earned tenure. Principal purpose of tenure is to safeguard academic freedom, which is necessary for all who teach and conduct research in higher education, explains the American Association of University Professors. When faculty members can lose their positions because of their speech, publications, or research findings, they cannot properly fulfill their core responsibilities to advance and transmit knowledge. 
In other words, if you want academics to engage in quality thinking, they have to be allowed to think out loud without fear of being fired if they say something that makes someone angry. Courageous Conversations was heavily influenced by diversity trainers Robin D'Angelo's white fragility. Ah ha ha, okay, okay. I was leaked an audio copy of the full two-hour Courageous Conversations event. About an hour and 20 minutes in, Parrot says, Hi, I would like to speak, if I may. The moderator replied, "Mm Mm-hmm, indicating that she could go ahead. Parrot then explained that she had noticed something she was hoping to point out to the group and ask if she could have five minutes to read a statement she had prepared. The facilitator didn't respond to this, at least not audibly, and a beat later, Parrot began. Over the past couple of weeks, a lot has happened, Parrot began. Protests have occurred. Riots have broken out. People have been killed. Remember, this was back over the summer. And across the United States, companies, organizations, and schools have proclaimed their support of a movement called anti-racism. Here, Parrot began referring to the capital A variety. Parrot went on to complain about the segregated setting of the training and what she saw as the generally closed-minded nature of the nation's post-Floyd discourse. Democracy thrives on conversations, but what we are seeing happening right now in the United States is not a conversation, she read. It is a coup. Everyday Americans of all colors, creeds, backgrounds, beliefs are being held hostage. Zealots are telling us, you're either with us or against us, and if you're not against us, you're an evil bigot. They are telling us you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. They are telling us that all people may be classified into two sides, us and them. Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, people of color or white, righteous or bigoted, oppressed or privileged. I don't accept these false dichotomies and I don't accept the ad hominem implications that come with it. Too often, words like privilege, defensive, and fragile are just ways to dismiss what another person has to say. Too often, words like racist are just a way to intimidate someone into silence. Parrot argued that people should work together to solve real problems like wealth disparity, poverty, job insecurity, unemployment, the high cost of living, or the fracturing of the nuclear family, whatever form that family takes. But we are waylaid by those who claim the real problems are racism, sexism, transphobia, and hateful words. Thank you, Elsa, the facilitator said, cutting Parrot off about three minutes into her remarks. No, you don't cut me off. I'm going to finish what I have to say, she responded. I'm going to ask that you share the platform with the rest of the nearly 200 people who are here today, replied the facilitator. But Parrot continued for about another minute, telling the all-white attendees of the mandatory segregated conversation that universities should be places where ideas could be discussed, explored, debated, and and assessed, and that This is not that. The whole thing took closer to four minutes, more than the five Parrot had asked for, but it did undeniably disrupt the event and change its tenor. According to Parrot, the side chat bar lit up during and after her segment and many of her colleagues saying that they were disturbed by what she was saying. Sentiments that expressed vocally after Parrot finished her address. Yeah, that was awkward, said one colleague. It would be wonderful if you could help us in processing that, another participant told the facilitator. The facilitator, in turn referred everyone to the emotion slide that the group had been using to indicate what emotions its members were feeling. And from there, things got heated and a bit of a pile-on ensued. The group seemed unhappy. Parrot had interjected such a skeptical and defiant note about the proceedings. A fair amount of crosstalk and accusations ensued, though she says a number of other colleagues thanked her, mostly privately, for speaking up. And what if those colleagues had been more vocal in their support of her. What if those colleagues had spoken up publicly too? What if those colleagues had had her back? It's going to come for you at some point, folks. You're not going to be able to avoid this. During the minor uproar during the event, the initial response from LW Tech's administration appeared positive. Suzanne Ames, LW Tech's vice president of instruction, called Parrot after the training and asked if she was okay. It seemed supportive, said Parrot. I thought she was trying to be nice to me. And this is how they play it. Because because remember, they're the side of empathy. They're the side of compassion. But never, ever forget the rules that they're actually playing by. But five days later, on June 24th, Parrot received an email from President Morrison with the subject line, The Fallout from Your Actions, last Friday. It began... In the seven years I have served as president and 20 years in community and technical college system, I have never before sent such a serious email to any faculty member, let alone one newly tenured. 
She wrote that as a result of Parrot's statements, many of your colleagues spent hours trying to decompress with their respective supervisors. The only choice was an investigation because of your egregious behavior, which has led to substantial harm to hundreds of colleagues on campus. I have asked Dr. Ames, Dean Doug Emery, and the executive director of HR, Mina Park, to meet with you in the next few days to have a serious conversation about how successful you can possibly be on campus in the future. That's the firing meeting. For anyone who's never been fired before or is not familiar with this process, that is the firing meeting. Now, they can't actually fire her though. This is a complication for them. If she was not a tenured faculty member, she would have been gone. She would have been gone almost immediately. Maybe they would have had to do a little investigation just because it's a public university, but she would have been, just like Jody Shaw, man, Jody Shaw at Smith College spoke up about what she saw happening. She was put on administrative leave. I, I and, and she eventually resigned, but I'll tell you, I, it would have shocked me completely if the college had ever taken her off administrative leave. That's not how it works. Once you go on administrative leave, they're basically kicking you out. They're showing you the door. From there, LW Tech's disciplinary apparatus, both formal and informal, ramped up. Two days after Morrison's email, an administrator informed Parrot that she was being placed on paid administrative leave for the summer quarter because of allegations of a serious offense. She would immediately lose access to her LW Tech email and to Canvas, the university's online learning platform. The nature of the offense was not specified because she didn't break any rules. And it doesn't matter if you break rules or not because, remember... We don't care about right and wrong anymore. We only care about getting people who dissent out. That's it. The same day Morrison devoted the entirety of her regular all-campus email update sent out to thousands of people to denouncing Parrot by name. This email is a dramatic departure from the typical Amy's updates, the 16 100 word message started. The incident at the training session, Morrison argued, was so damaging that I asked the executive cabinet, EDI council, and the bias response team to assist me with a college-wide message. Morrison wrote to the community that she was stunned, disappointed, angry, and shocked by Parrot's dissent during the training. Parrot was being removed from her teaching duties, she explained, to ensure students are protected from conduct the likes of which she displayed last week. In addition, LW Tech would be establishing a new anti-racism task force and Morrison would be holding meetings with LW Tech's black employees. We will continue race-based caucusing over the summer, she assured her college, for as long as is needed. In the same day the email went out, Parrot received the sole official disciplinary complaint this incident had generated. It was filed by Suzanne Ames, the administrator who had given Parrot that seemingly supportive call. The woman that called her after this meeting. That's who filed the disciplinary complaint. Never, ever, ever, ever turn your back on these people or trust them for one red second. The complaint accused Parrot of insolent, insubordinate, and disruptive behavior that was downright scary, startling, and bewildering, bewildering as she yelled a diatribe. And she said she had used her new positional power as a tenured professor in a very corrupt, insolent, and insubordinate manner. And then they go on to talk about how essentially essentially what, what Ames said is that she yelled and she was angry in the meeting, but the, this reporter who had the audio version of the meeting didn't actually hear any yelling. So what, I, what they actually end up saying is apparently, apparently Parrot was aggressively yelling at folks in the meeting, with, but it was the kind of aggressive yelling that doesn't show up on audio. In addition to being Parrot's friend and colleague, Phil Schneider is her union grievance officer and had been serving as her advocate since the Courageous Conversation events. Thank, bless, bless your heart, Phil. Thank God for people like Phil, who will do the right thing regardless. He says that LW Tech's pursuit of Parrot hasn't followed the disciplinary procedures laid out in the college contract with its employees. Instead, Parrot and Snyder claimed Morrison had appointed an ad hoc group of administrators to run an investigation that wasn't following any established procedure. The ends justify the means. According to these documents, the investigation was based on dozens of interviews with witnesses, as well as relevant evidence such as Zoom chats, text, and comments, a Herculean effort to understand a four-minute 
interruption and its aftermath from every conceivable angle. The parent investigation was very expensive for the college. In December, Parrot forwarded me an email from Mina Park, LW Tech's Executive Director of Human Resources, in which Park noted, the bill for the investigation is nearing $80,000. This is a public institution. That's your taxpayer money right there, state of Washington. Well, we know the state of Washington mostly doesn't care about that. But this is the other reason why it's so critical for other people to speak up. You think they're going to spend $80,000 investigating every single person at a public institution? If you, like, you have to put as many barriers in their way as possible. And if you aren't going to do it, then do not be surprised when they win. Then suddenly the whole thing was over. On March 26, LW Tech sent Parrot a note informing her that her final punishment would be, had been determined. A written reprimand paired with guidance pertaining to her future behavior. While it was mostly over, the document's language is strange in some ways. The draft report's language was strange. Snyder isn't happy, for example, that the reprimand dictates that Professor Parrott must not interrupt or undermine college efforts to fulfill the 2021-24 to mission fulfillment statement, including addressing and dismantling structural racism. The fuzziness of the language could put Parrott at risk, since she has a myriad of disagreements with her colleagues or with her college about how to fight structural racism, and since she has every right to undermine within reason a goal she doesn't agree with. Snyder is on it, though. I'm preparing a protest, and yet other possible grievance requesting the references to topics Elsa may not discuss be eliminated. It is fairly remarkable that such a costly and convoluted investigation led to a written reprimand. She likely would have agreed, I wouldn't have accepted a written reprimand at the start of the process if it had been offered, but I do think I ever could have accepted a demand that I stopped voicing my, but I do not think I could ever have accepted a demand that I stop voicing my dissent publicly. It doesn't matter because no such deal was offered anyway. LW Tech did not respond to a request for comment and why it did not present Parrot with such an offer before embarking on an $80,000 investigation. This is what we're up against, folks. This is it right here. Now what's going to happen at this college is this college is going to go through every possible step imaginable to make her life miserable. They're going to try to get her to quit. There is nothing, and no, no one making her miserable is going to be punished in any way, shape, or form. This is going to be a concerted effort from every level of the institution to harass her, to make her life miserable, to make her job impossible. They might even try to bring her up on, on other forms of charges that have nothing to do with the incident, possibly pertaining to teaching or... I, I don't know. I don't know what other her job responsibilities are. But what, what, what organizations tend to do in situations like this is they come in from the side. They're like, oh, we're not punishing you for this thing over here, but we're going to get you hard for this, this one little transgression that we're going to grossly distort over here. That's what's going to happen to her. And thank God she's got someone that has her back. But listen, if you don't start wrapping your head around the fact that this is going to come for you at some point, I don't know what to tell you. Everyone needs to be speaking up. Everyone needs to be pushing back. And when people go out on a limb, even if they do it imperfectly, because it does sound, to be quite frank, like she did it imperfectly. But even when they do it imperfectly, you still need to have their back. Because you don't want to be these guys, but you do need to know what rules they're playing by. And you don't, you should never, ever, 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 ever expect them to play nice because they're beyond that point. All right, guys, that's all I've got for this video. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel, hitting that like button, leaving a comment, leave a comment. Let me know how you would have handled the situation. Share it out with your friends and family, especially any of them that happen to work in higher education because they haven't seen this yet. They're really, really, really lucky. That's all I've got for right now. I'll see you soon.